pray for the lovely and talented Rachel here. She is out sick this morning. So she's definitely ill and highly contagious. So make sure you go by and see her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll see some food. Say this morning. <laughs> Surprise. All right. Welcome, Chris Scott. Are we ready? All right. All right. Let's see if we can get started this morning. Right on late. Surprising. So let's stand together this morning. We will sing praises to our Lord. And King, hope you've been doing it all week. Hope you've been spending time with the Lord and enjoying His presence this week. And uh, this, let's continue that uh, into our new week today. Jim. <laughs> Scripture, 
How many times we find ourselves because of a natural fallen state, we find ourselves back in a condition and a situation we shouldn't find ourselves in. And God, because of His manifold mercy, Psalm says, He rescues us again. Well, that's love right there. How many times must God look at us and say, didn't we just rescue you from this and then you find yourself back in this situation and, and God's mercy, you know, the Bible says in 1 John that if we confess our sins, faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Man, I love the fact that our God is a forgiving God, a loving God, a good Father to us. Yeah. 
God, as a family of believers, we come together this morning lifting your name. Lord God, we know that you're worthy of our praise. Lord God, we lift your name this morning. Lord God, also we understand that there are many, many needs. Lord God, we stand in your presence today, Lord, asking you to just speak to us, Lord, use us. Lord, uh, Lord help us to see, Lord God, what you have for us. Lord God, I just pray that you would, Lord, just pour out your spirit on us today, Lord. Uh, help us, Lord, to see that that you have us uh, for us this today. Before Brother Scott does what he's going to do this morning, uh, let me let me say this. We have uh, Brother Tony Miller. And Brother Tony Miller, uh, as you know, has uh, has cancer, and they call it terminal cancer. Uh, but you know, we are we're all terminal. Um, the Bible says, "When the man wants to die, after the judgment." But Brother Tony Miller, man, he just has such a great testimony and great witness. And, uh, but he's at the hospital this morning. He's really struggling today. So what I'd like to do, if I could, just get somebody, uh, just a, a friend, a believer, uh, to come up and, and just word a special prayer for Brother Tony Miller. If somebody's willing to do that. Uh, there we go, Brother James, if you could do that. Father God, I know that I love Tony. And I know, like I say, you speak for a lot of people here. I love him so much. He just touched my life. He just touched so many lives. And he's had such a powerful testimony for you. And, uh, Father God, we just come before you and just lift him up to you. Father, we know, and no doubt about it, that you can heal him instantly. Uh, that's, not a, that's not a problem for you. We also know that you're using him mightily and uh, bringing you glory and honor. And I just want to lift him up. We lift him up as a family and his family up, his wife and children. And we just ask, Father God, that your mighty hand would just work on him in such a way that, uh, that we would just see you work, Lord. That's what it's all about. I know he loves you and he loves you. And uh, we just thank you, Father, for everything that you're doing. And we love you and we just lift him up and give to you. In Jesus' most powerful, awesome name. Amen. Amen. Man, thank you so much for being here this morning, and we are delighted that each and every one of you are here, and if you are visiting with us for the first time, we want to let you know how much we appreciate you taking time to be here, and we trust that you will feel right at church, and I want to invite you to take your bulletin, and at the end of your bulletin, you will find a contact card, and as a visitor especially, if you wouldn't mind filling out that contact card, you can tear it off along the perforation there and put it in the offering plate at the end of the service. And we can have a record of your visit or if there's any way that we can help you, you can indicate that on that contact card. Uh, anyone is uh, able to fill out, uh, uh, we invite you to use that contact card if you have a prayer request or uh, any kind of a need. You need a visit with Brother Tony or anything like that. Fill that out, and we will handle that accordingly. But we appreciate you so much being here this morning, and we're looking forward to continuing uh, praising the Lord this morning and uh, to a uh, to a ter uh, tremendous message from Brother Tony. So we trust that you come with your hearts prepared for that. <coughs> and so we would like to have our Bible reading, and if you are able, if you would please stand for our Bible reading which will be found in Luke chapter 1. And as you're looking for Luke chapter 1, we will dismiss Children's Church. So Children's Church, you can be dismissed. If you are visiting with us, we have a Children's Church program designed for children up through about 3rd or 4th grade. And they meet just a few feet away in this hallway back to your right. And you are welcome to go back there if your child has not been there before. You're welcome to go back there and uh, meet our children's workers and see the program that goes on there. So we invite you to do that. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 for our Bible reading verses 3 and 4. The Bible says, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. 
and let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for a pastor that preaches the truth in love. We pray that you would guide and direct him in his thoughts and his words, uh, that he would uh, say the, the things that you would have for him to say this hour, and you know what he has uh, studied and prepared and meditated upon. So we pray that our hearts would be receptive for uh, the part of this message that applies to us both individually and collectively, and that we would draw closer to you because of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, um, I love this verse in, in, in Luke chapter number 1. Luke is writing and, and he's, he's making record of, of the birth of Christ and what Christ, um, God with us, is doing in His world. Of course, Christ came. He came for uh, redemption for all mankind which should really jazz you this morning. And that'll, that'll make you excited. It'll be your motivation in this life. Um, and so this, this idea of, um, of what God is doing in His world. And it doesn't matter if it's the Christmas story with quotations around it, because Genesis through Revelation is the Christmas story. It's, it's the Christ story. It's the, it's the God story. And, uh, and if you are a believer, that's your story. Somebody, uh, we are talking about, I had a grandbaby born Friday, a root. And somebody's like, I don't know what you're so excited about, you didn't do anything. I said, oh yeah. Oh yeah, there was no grandbaby without me, baby. So let's, let's start right there. Um, and so God's story is your story. You're a child of God. And that, that whole thing ought to just excite you. That, and so when you see, is God moving in God's world, then you all say, man, that every part of that excites me. That's why Bible study and, and, and Bible reading and Christian music and whatever. And, and, and so it's, it always is amazing to me when I hear Christians. And the majority of what they do is complaining about what other people do that they don't, they don't think is right about it. Man, look, I, there was a, you know what my grandbaby did? One of the first things he did? Pooped. I didn't make a big issue about it. Baby pooped. Okay, but I love a grandbaby. Okay, I got, I got to get what's going on here. Um, but, but in the Christian life, this whole thing, read from Genesis to Revelation, you see God's people doing crazy things that they shouldn't do. And God having to, to set things straight. But make no mistake about this, God is moving in God's world. We just got done with revival. Love having revival. But here's something that happens every year in revival. <laughs> and I, and I, love, I love seeing this as a pastor. You have, you, have, you have two basic groups in revival. You have that this was the best revival you've ever had group. You know why? They were revived. That's where they were in what God is doing in this world. And you have the, I don't know, Brother Tony, is God not working in this world? I don't know. It just seems like things are spiritually dead around here. Uh, yeah, I know. Guess what? Guess what the one common denominator is in those two scenarios? The person sitting in your seat and standing in your shoes. And I don't want to be ugly about it, man, but the, you don't have a God problem. I promise. I don't know, Brother Tony, it's a dark world, and, and it doesn't seem like God's working. Yeah, okay, well, I don't think I'd say that out loud not too many times if I was you. Okay, because what we don't have today is a God's not working in His world problem. God's at work in His world. The question is, am I part of what God's doing in His world? And that's not a deal about whether or not God is reaching out to me. God reached out to me. It's whether or not I'm responding to what God has done in His world. So we talked about last week how God uses common people. We talked about Zechariah and Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph, shepherds, wise men, the people we think about when we think of the Christmas story. And you, I don't care, you go from Genesis to Revelation, they're just people people. Even in the heroes of the faith, we think of the heroes of the faith. And, and you know, we think of people like Moses. Man, I wish I could be a Moses. The Bible says Moses was the meekest of all men who ever lived. Well, I wish I was dynamic. I wish I was strong. Yeah, probably Moses did too. God said, I'm going to send you to Moses. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh, he told Moses. And Moses was like, yeah, I wish you wouldn't do that. <laughs> that seems like a bad plan. And God said, no, you're the guy. And he said, I don't speak well. And then to the place where God finally said, fine. Yeah. 
Aaron's coming. He'll be your mouthpiece. <laughs> and so there you go, man. But listen, God is working in his world. So in the story of Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ, God with us, God in flesh, the incarnation of God came to us in this world. God began again in a different way, in a new way. God never changes, but he's always doing something new. So don't be freaked out when you see something new, something different. I was raised um, in different kinds of churches and different kinds of, seeing different kinds of things. And I always remember people, uh, I was in, in one, one kind of church where they were always talking about the old paths. Let's God go back to the old path. You know what they meant? The 50s. <laughs> I'm like, bro, God's way older than that. You know, you really want to go back to the old paths and strap on some sandals. Roll with it. Right? We'll all get some robes and sandals and we'll, you know, we can do that. I'm in. Whatever. But, uh, but, but let's, 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 not, let's not get caught up in the traditional part of it. Let's look at what is God doing in God's world right now. Let's get involved in what God is doing in His world. So here in God's world, we talked about last week how God uses common people. Now let's look at how God does what God does. And He has unique tasks for all of us. Every member of God's body, if God has saved you with His awesome and incredible grace, God has given you a job. If you today say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, God has given you a mission inside His kingdom. Nobody's job is to watch. Nobody has the spectator job. Nobody in the army of God is in the secret service. Or, hey man, what are you doing in the army of God? I'm in the secret service. No, you're not in the secret service, bro. <laughs> you're not that guy. Right? You're not like the guy who, 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 who was in, in the church where, where the guy was saying amen. Everybody, everybody kept looking back at him. Finally, Dick went back there and said, what's wrong with you? And the guy said, I got it. He said, well, be quiet. You didn't get it here. <laughs> I'm like, look, man, you can get excited about what God is doing in your world because he has a unique task for you. You are uniquely designed in your desires, in your makeup, in your abilities, in your experiences to do something for God. God. And here we see God picking common people, regular people in His world, to do some unique tasks that are going to seem kind of, you know, not, not spectacular at first, to do something incredible in His world. Incredible. I mean, can you think of a, a more significant event in world history? Than God coming in human form. I mean, you probably have some Christmas events planned. What if God was coming to your house? I mean, we do some pretty silly things around this time of year. Which, my wife is not here. She's told me not to, to go too far or down this trail. But we do some pretty silly and ridiculous stuff this time of year. We're going to pause for emphasis right there. Just so you can get your mind around and think about it for a little bit. Just some dumb stuff. In preparation. Okay. But God Himself plans to come into your life, into your experience, and do some awesome things. But He has, and He wants to work in His world, but He expects you and I to do the legwork. So how does it look? How does it look in His coming? First of all, there's this family ministry experience. This is something every one of us can do. This family ministry experience, this family of influence idea. God has a ministry for every one of us to do. And look at what he does in Zechariah and Elizabeth's example. He says in verse number, uh, verse number 13 of Luke chapter number 1. We're going to be in Luke chapter number 1 a little bit in the book of Matthew. But the Bible says in Luke chapter number 1, and we'll begin in verse number 13. The angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias. Now you remember that, that Zacharias and Elizabeth, they couldn't have children. He comes, the angel Lord comes to him and says, You're going to have a child. His name's going to be John. I'm not going to name him after you. Well, that says something right there. When you're raising children, you're not supposed to be making little yous. My son just had a child, and, and I remember when, when, when he was uh, less mature than he is now, uh, which if you knew my son, would be, not be hard for you to imagine. Um, and, and I can remember him saying, I can't wait till I have a child, I can shake him in my own image. 
Right? I've just enough Bible experience to get you in trouble. I can shape him in my own image. That's not God's plan for your children. He didn't want to make it a little used. You're going to have a child. You're not going to name him after you. You're going to name him like I want to name him. He's going to be named something that relates to me. Brings him back to me. We'll talk about that later on. But the experience and the idea behind this family of influence is just basically this. Follow God's plan. God has a plan for your family. I, I dare say that a, that a week doesn't go by when I don't talk to somebody uh, about what's going on in their family unit, in their family experience. And that is God's primary place here on this earth where we can experience and show who God is and how God works. Because in no place in this world do we have the opportunity to show the patience and love of God than who we share toilet paper with 24 hours a day. Seven days a week. Because, man, we, and things start getting hard then. I mean, you start having, right, the, the, these interpersonal relationship issues and things and stresses where, where you really start realizing how different men and women are. And then you think kids come in and, and you thought that you are going to have kids and they were just going to, you know, you're going to be the beavers, you know, and this, this, you're going to just carry on the episode of Leave the Beaver and everything's going to be awesome. <laughs> And you didn't realize that, 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 that you really should have made no, we really should have made the word no two syllables so it would have been harder for our kids to learn. <laughs> Just too easy a word to learn. I realized that last night when, when uh, Carly and Jonathan went out after the teen thing and left Kinsey at our house, that, that no, it's just too easy a word. Like, you want this? No. <laughs> you want this? No. <laughs> you lay down and go back? No. You want one of these? No. Because that's your last option. Right? But this family of influence, it begins what? It begins with falling into, and it's simple. Listen again, this is not a, this is not a hard job to understand, but, but many times a hard job to apply. I want to fall into the pattern that God has given me in my family so that I can be an influence for him in his world. That's my number one job. So that when people see my family, they see God who came to us. A family of influence. Notice what he says. He says, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for the prayer, thy prayer is heard. And Elizabeth thy wife shall bear a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Here's the plan for your family, Zacharias. Are you ready? Are you sitting down? Do what I tell you to do. Here's my plan. Elizabeth's going to have a son, and you're going to call his name John. <coughs> Did you get any, any feedback from Zacharias? Nope. It's just God telling Zacharias what the family's going to look like. And that ought to be, that's how we have a family of influence. Okay, Lord, let me sit down. Let me open your word. You tell me what the family looks like, and that's what I'll do. It's this family of influence that is a result of just following God's simple plan. Second, we see by doing our part in God's simple plan. What we want, Lord, please make my family a family of influence so we can be a testimony for you. Ready, go. And God's like, already went. It's your turn to go. I did my part. I came and I showed you the pattern and I gave you my word. But Tony, why is my family not doing it? Why is my marriage not the kind of marriage it ought to be? I don't know. Did you, did you read the instructions? Right now, in my foyer, in my front door, there are two big boxes. I don't know what it, what's in them. I don't do Christmas shopping. Rachel buys all that stuff. But there's something that i got to open up. And, 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 and the, the worst Christmas words, some of the worst Christmas words of all time, some assembly require. Yeah. <laughs> and it's going to require that I follow the instructions. Right? So Kenzie's not, not old enough to know. She, she, she has a word when, when, when she's talking to me. It's vroom vroom. Because we'll drive around in my truck and I'll let her hold the steering wheel. So we got her her own little vroom vroom. Right? She can sit in. I like she's driving in school. I got a little remote control. I can, I can control it myself. So it's the best of both worlds. It's giving me energy. But if I want it to work, I'm going to have to follow the instructions. I'm going to sit her down in that thing and just fall all apart. And my wife's going to look at me like, what happened? She's going to know immediately what happened. You didn't follow instructions. 
And here's what ordinarily happens in the Christian life. What ordinarily happens in the Christian life, we jump into this marriage situation, falls apart, and we look at God. How could you do this to me? He's like, oh. I've even heard people literally say, somebody should write a book. I'm like, why? Yeah. Somebody wrote a book, man. Did you read the book? Yeah, somebody did write a book. Do your part. Listen to what he tells Zacharias. And thou shall have joy and gladness, and, may and, and, and uh, many shall receive joy, joy at his birth, and he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. So now, you're going to take this child and you're going to set him apart. He's not going to have wine or strong drink. They're going to be certain. It almost implies he's going to have this Nazarite vow on him and he has to be set apart because certain things have to happen in his life. Now that was Zacharias and Elizabeth's part. God said, I have a plan. You have a part. This is what we don't understand. We, would, we just want God to do his plan without us doing our part. And it doesn't work. It's never going to work. Well, God had a plan for my life. He, he does and still does. And he'll even recalculate from where you are. That's how awesome God is. But he won't do it if you don't do your part. I thought God is sovereign. He is sovereign. Way sovereign. But he's not going to give you something you don't want. Not going to give you a blessing that you don't want to get. He's not going to force his plan on you. Then, by relying on God's power. Well, we got way too many Christians trying to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. I'm just going to try really, I'm going to try harder to love my wife. I'm going to try harder to feel it. Well, that's just a weird deal, isn't it? But that's why I just don't feel it. You don't feel it. Man, I would hate to think I'm living my whole life based on how I feel. It's not, not feelings. It's God's plan. I'm going to go back to the plan. If I start putting this broom broom together... What happens if I just get frustrated and I'm not feeling it? Somebody's going to have not a holly jolly Christmas. I don't care how you feel about it. Well, I feel like it really ought to be put together this way. Well, guess what, bro? You're not the designer. Probably I'll let the designer do the designing and you do the plan follow. I mean, guys in this room have started putting something together and then thought to yourself, well, I got a better idea. Yeah, you got an ideal. Now you got an ordeal. And this is what happens with marriage people. This is what happens with family people. And this is why we're not families of influence in this world. And the world looks at Christian families and they're just as, 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 as uh, in bad a shape as they are. And they're like, oh, God don't look real to me. Why? Because our families don't look real. And it doesn't really matter if you have, listen, I got dysfunction in, in my family. My family has put the funk in dysfunction. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It's not whether or not you have problems. It's whether or not the problems have you. Amen. What are you going to do and how are you going to respond? Even in this whole thing at the hospital, there were things that went that we didn't like. It's how are you going to respond to it? Are you going to, let, are you going to be an influence for Jesus Christ when you have difficulties in your life? And you're, there are going to be things that you don't like. What are you going to do then? You still going to be an influence and an influencer in this world? It's got to start right there at your family. It's got to start right there where, where the rubber meets the road. But not just an influencer in our family, a family of impact. So we do the things that we do in our family, where we just do that stuff, where we're raising our children to know in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We're being the kind of spouses that we ought to be. We're just being that kind of family unit that we're supposed to be. But then we understand that not just are our family supposed to be something that people can look at and say, hey, that, that right there looks like a Christian family. When they have difficulties, when they fall, when they have mistakes, they get back up and they say, hey, I was wrong and God is right. They do things that, that, that look like Christ. They live their life based on Christ. But not just that. Let's look at the family of Joseph and Mary. Here's what was said there. They're this family of impact. We want our families not just to be a picture, but we want our families to reach out and impact other people. Amen. To where we can, actually, we can actually say, hey, those people were helped not just by what they saw, 
but by how we acted with them and interacted with them. How did it happen? What does it look like? First of all, we understand that we as families have a higher call. It's higher than just we're going to do our family stuff and let it go. Look at what the Bible says when he's talking to um, Joseph and Mary. The Bible says uh, um, in, um, in verse number 31 of chapter number 1, Behold, thou shalt conceive, and in thy womb thou shalt bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall be great. We know what Jesus came to do to redeem this world. We understand that our families have a job. We have a mission given by God. Not just to be families. Not just to be the Waltons. It's awesome when people can look at our families and say, hey, that's, that man, I think I can be a Christian because they're being Christians. And they're worse than me. Right? They got things, they got, they, they're, they're more difficult than me. You know how many people have considered coming to Christ and talk about Christ because of, of Tony Miller's testimony and, and the change in his family? Just because of influence. But wait, how about impact? How about when, 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 when somebody in a family decides, hey, we're going to reach out and make contact with another family. See, Jesus in this family, the picture is, and what even John did in, in the family of Zacharias and Elizabeth, he leaves that family and he goes and makes a higher impact. Why? Because he understands that each family has a higher call than just the family. We have that higher call of other people. Not just a higher call. Notice also a higher level of complexity. With the higher call, there's always going to be a higher level of complexity. Every time you draw closer to the Lord, He's going to draw closer to you. But with that, 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 that accepting of a higher call for the Lord, what you're going to find is that things are going to become a little more complex. As, as I want to serve the Lord more, what's going to happen is it's going to get in the way of me more. So, so it's going to be, uh, you know, if I'm going to be a witness for the Lord, then there's some stuff I'm going to have to eat. So I'm going to go to work. And somebody's going to be mean to me. And I'm going to want to bite their head off, spit between their shoulders. But then I can't be a person of influence. So then I'm going to have to eat it. That's complex. I really don't like it. But I'm going to have to figure it out. In, in this idea of, of being impactful. Real time, I don't like to talk to people. People don't like to talk about politics and religion. Well, they still do. It's the things that matter. It's the things that make sense to people. I just got to figure out a way. Or well, I'm not gifted in, in, in evangelism. Yeah, you are. may not be your main gift, but you're gifted because why? What you are called to do, you're gifted to do. God's not going to just leave you hanging. What you just have to figure out is how. How are you going to be an impact for God somewhere else? God with us, this higher level of complexity. In verse number 34, Mary says, man, this is a great idea about the Savior coming through me, except for, uh, I'm a virgin. And it was a real problem for Joseph. <coughs> Joseph's like, uh, uh, that's my wife, and she's pregnant, and we're not married yet. This is a problem. We're like, well, it's of the Holy Spirit. That's not better. I mean, if I'm Joseph, you tell me, well, the baby's from the Lord. Now, how am I supposed to live up to that? <laughs> that ain't good, man. I mean, my wife had other boyfriends, but the first one is the Lord? <laughs> what, what am I going to do with that? I just now thought of that. I don't think I probably should have said it during the message. <laughs> but, but still, I mean, I don't know what I'm... I'm a, I'm not going to follow that up. Well, you're no God. Well, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> God, yeah, I need Rachel on the front. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Waving me off. The point is simply this. Look. Joseph and Mary have this level of complexity in their life. Because why? Because the move of higher impact in their life. It basically goes to this. The reason that we're not people in families of higher impact is because as impact grows, so does complexity. We don't like the complexity, therefore we just say, uh, you know, I'm just not called to do it. It's not how it works. We accept the complexity. We accept that things are going to be more difficult as we accept that God has called us to something higher in His world. 
C, a higher level of compensation. Here's what's awesome about it. The idea that the kingdom is real. Notice what he says in verse number 32. And his name will be great. That he is going to do great things and that, that he is going to be given the throne of his father David. Hear this, this prophecy of the Messiah. He's going to be the Messiah, the chosen one, the one that you've always heard about. Once you've studied about it, he's going to save his people from their sins. This idea that as Christians, as families step up and there's this, this higher level, a higher call. My dad and, and mom and I, and we, uh, Rachel and some of us had, had, uh, had uh, supper the other day, uh, lunch the other day together. And we were talking about my grandfather and, and, um, and, and some of the things that he's trying to do with, with some money situations and things. And, and we were talking about um, inheritance. My dad was saying, you know, one of the things that I'm sorry about is I don't have much inheritance to leave to my children. I said, that's not true. Let's look, read the, the, the book of Proverbs says that the price of God's wisdom and the, the, and what God, the things of God are far above rubies. And that which God has is not even to be compared to it. As you realize that, that, that there is nothing in this world that I would trade for the heritage that my dad and mom gave me? Nothing. Not a gold monkey. I'm not sure what that is. That's something Big Gary used to say. But it sounds very valuable. There's nothing in this world I would trade for the Christian heritage, for the peace, for the love, for the patience, for the, for the things I've experienced in this life is through God. Nothing. And I hope if I give anything to my children that they get to experience that in this life. That they get to experience the impact of a godly home. And I hope today that you understand that that's what God has given you to do in this world. And that your family ends up impacting another family. Look, I understand the Bible says a wise man lays up for his children and his children's children. That's awesome. And, and I hope that what you lay up primarily is godly wisdom and instruction. Because God has called you to a higher level of compensation. But not just family. Notice what else. We have these working witnesses too. Not just what goes on in our family, but also what goes on in our world. We've got to hurry, but look at Luke chapter number 2. Well, uh, at these other guys, these shepherds, what they were called to do. Three things just real quick. First of all, why were they called to this purpose? These are people, these working witnesses, which we are all in this world, and many of you out in the workplace, and many of you leave the house and, and go out into a business or, or somewhere. This is what we were talking about. Here are these shepherds. They had a unique task to do too, and they were in a work-a-day world. They're out there watching sheep. Why were they called? Why? They were familiar with the people in the area. When they go, and you'll see what they do here in just a second, they already, they already knew these people. They were familiar with them. They were out there doing what God had called them to do. Now, God has called you to be a witness for Him where you are. Notice where these shepherds were. The Bible says they were in the same country. Man, my workplace, man, that's like, a, like, like working with the devil himself out there. Well, guess what? God put an influence at your work. The problem is he sits at your desk and he's always quiet. He's not a person of influence and he's not a person of impact. It's not that God had not put Christian influence in your work. People always cussing and carrying on out there. Well, guess what, man? If you were a person of influence and you were a person of impact and you walked up and somebody's cussing, they'd start slurring cuss words, which is fun for the Christian if you get, it, get the use of it. I told you about the guy at the golf course. I told my Christian about hole number three. He hit one in the woods. He said, Mother Francis. I was just, that was awesome. I said, like the hospital? He said, I always say Mother Francis. I'm like, it's fine, man. If you need to cuss your golf ball, cuss your golf ball. I'll listen. He lasted like two more holes. He was out. That's cool. It was at the driving range one time. This guy came up, and, and me and Dennis Sarah were the guy who just did the, uh, the, uh, the uh, revival. And this guy walks up, and he says, you guys from out of town? I said, he is. I'm, I'm local. He told me, Dennis said, I guess you guys notice ain't no nightlife around here. I said, you looking for nightlife? Yeah, always. So we have a revival in New York. He left his golf clubs, golf balls, and everything. We just 
influence that whole place. <laughs> Problem is, we're not interested in being an influence. We're not interested in being an impact. How do people know you? How do people know you in your world? God put you right where he put you. In the place he put you. In the time he put you. To be an influence and to have impact. But it's going to be hard to be uncomfortable. I know. High level of vision. High level of compensation. But if you're going to make a difference for God, you're going to see God work in your world. That's what has to happen. Like, hey man, I ain't mad at you. Just let's all be clear about what the score is. Be clear about who I am. You can do whatever you want to do. Right? I played on a couple of city league teams, softball, basketball, and that kind of stuff. They just knew. After we got done, don't invite me to the bar. I'm not going. It was even joy of my life. Don't ask T.O. He is not going. <laughs> Right? No, not go. Not smoking weed, not, not going weed, just not going to do it. Familiar with the people in the area? Not just that, these people were fired up about the vision. They'd seen this heavenly vision. You know why we're not people of impact? You know why we don't do the work? We're not excited about it. These guys, they were excited about it. They said, and it came to pass, and the angels were gone away from um, into heaven. The shepherds said one another, let us now go. Let us go right now. Even in the Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. <laughs> He's like, G did you see that? Is this real? Yeah, well, let's go see. Let's go see. Let's go experience what God is doing in this world. Man, I'm telling you, if you as a believer, and you say, well, turn around, you know, I'm not, I'm not really one of them high-level believers. I mean, I got a job. Yeah, you do have a job. <laughs> You sure do. God gave him one. He put you right where he put you for a reason. Amen. To be impactful in this world. They were just fired up about the vision. And then they were fervent about the message. What did they do in verse number 17? They went and saw. And then they went back and watched the sheep. Because that's what shepherds do. Back in my you ever wondered, where were the sheep? <laughs> Brother Tony, I gotta watch the sheep, man. Gotta watch the sheep. Uh... Do you know what they did? I'm going to tell you what the shepherds did with their sheep. Because you might say, well, brother, I'm busy. i got stuff to do. I'm going to tell you what the shepherds did with their sheep. You ready to sit down? You're taking notes? This is important. They figured it out. You know why? They had this higher vision, man. It's amazing how you figure it out. My son and his wife are going to have a baby. I have stuff to do. I got a call. Colby's going into labor. They're going to have a baby Friday. You know what I said? I'll see you Friday. What time is she going in? I had a meeting Friday morning. Come 9 o'clock, I told them, I got to go. They were still talking. I was like, I don't know if I'm speaking the King's English. I am leaving. <laughs> Figure it out. Right? Because priority things are priority things. You know why I don't have time for the Lord? Not priority. The sheep still going to be sheep when they get back. I don't know. They might have had to round it back up. Might have left them with somebody. Might have went on rotation. They were close. The Bible says they were in the same country. So they might have said, okay, look, you stay for this little while. You watch sheep. We're going to go. Then we're going to send somebody back. We'll spell you. I don't know how they did it, but they figured it out. Why? Because they were fired up about the vision. They were fervent about the message. Verse number 17 said they went all over the country telling people. Why? They knew them. They were familiar with them. They were from the, from the area. Made perfect sense to them. 90% recent study said 90% of people uh, who are members of church now say that they began to visit that church because they were invited by friends or family. Yes, sir. It goes like this. It's going to be hard. You're still taking notes. Uh, you going to come to church with me? Evangelism technique, number one. I mean, you ought to come to church with me. They may say no because you're not a person of influence or impact. They may say, I'm already better than you. <laughs> I'm already better a Christian than you, and I don't believe in God. That ain't good. Don't think for one second that don't happen all the time. That's something we got to look at our own heart. These were working witnesses. Then we have vocational. Listen, God may call you into something that's bigger. God may call you into something that's next level. We got something in here. We got the rights here. From the Hannah house. That's next level. Where you turn your whole life into a ministry. 
And I don't know how long y'all are doing that now. Getting paid yet? Nope. When I say vocational ministry, I don't mean you're getting a check. <laughs> Two years and haven't been paid yet and doing it full time. Still taking notes? Important. Vocational. And now we're getting to the kings. You know what the kings did? They left home. Could have been up to, well, it could have easily been up to 800 miles for these magi to get to Jesus. That's why they weren't there at the manger. They got there later on. 800 miles. You know what they said? You see that star? You know what that means, don't you? King born. New king of the Jews. You got to go. We got stuff to do. I know. Go see the king. Somebody better get the idea today that it's your job and mine to focus on the king. Got a lot of Christmas stuff going, going on there. Any of it about the king? It needs to all be about the king. Amen. Here we see these guys had this higher level. We're not even paid. You know, Paul wrote more scripture than anybody and was not full time. <laughs> Worked on tents. What is this? This is somebody with a loftier vision. This is somebody who says, you know what? This, this, I'm going to put some more effort in this. This is somebody who says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, look, this is, a, this is next level important. This may be a lay minister. This may be a full-time minister. I was telling a pastor the other day, I said, there are only two kind of people that pastor and go into, 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 into vocational ministry. Crazy people and call people. Make sure you're the latter. But listen, God has called you into ministry. Every member is a minister. Some people just say, hey, i got to go further. That's why I love the popes. Here this guy works in the oil field, goes down to Peru, gets a vision, sells everything he has, and goes. You know how much deputation he went on? None. Sells everything, goes. Why? Had a vision? Got to go. How we going to make it work? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is how my kids respond, used to respond when I said, you have your homework done. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not a sentence or even a word. But it's a lot of times how believers respond when they say, I'm fixing to do something next level. Notice they went, verse number one and two, we have to hurry. The Bible says, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod, the king, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king? They had a higher vision. Also, these people are people with a longer reach. Because they put more into it, they end up with longer reach. They say, listen, I'm going to make this a real part of my life. I'm going to make this a next level part of my life. And I'm going to reach out. I know that it's real and I know that it's important. So I'm going to have this longer reach of influence because here are these people coming up to 800 miles. It could have taken, um, you know, uh, eight months or so. Three to eight months for these guys to get to where they're going. I mean, this is a significant life investment. Where people understand, that, like Paul said, Christ, who is my life? I don't go to church. These are people who understand, I don't go to church. I am the church. I assemble with the believers who are the church. And I'm a part of these group of believers in this world who are the church. And we are planning on doing what God wants done in this world. These people have a longer reach and they make and have larger ability. Why? If for nothing else, not because they are more talented than you and I. That is not how it worked out. If you don't believe it, think about David and Goliath. David and Goliath, who was the last person who should have been on the battlefield? The kid. He had a larger ability because he was willing. If you're willing to follow the Lord, you have the ability. God will equip those He calls. You are called, God will equip you. Saul said, you're not able, you're a youth. He's a warrior from his youth. <coughs> they said, you're just going to probably need to step on back a little bit. Since you are the biggest guy out here, clearly don't know what you're talking about. He comes with shield, shield and sword, not come in the name of the Lord God. These guys, the Bible says, verse number 11, when they were come in the house, they saw 
the young child with Mary, his mother, they fell down and worshipped, and they worshipped him and opened their treasures, and they presented him. From this long distance, they presented him with things that other people didn't have the ability to present him with, this gold, this frankincense, this myrrh. And I wish we had time to go into the picture of these gifts. But they had this larger ability, which was to say, we're going to help you to begin this ministry that you're going into. We're going to present you with these gifts that are going to help you in this beginning part of your life. So I'm going to give you an example this morning. We'll close. How many believe... I'll give you two examples. Um, in the importance of family and being an influence and impact in your life. Um, how many of you enjoy, for example, hunting that kind of stuff? Chris Woods, sitting back there on the back front of the nursing window. Chris Woods, he likes to duck hunt. I don't really like to hunt because I don't like to clean stuff. <laughs> I like to kill stuff and I like to eat stuff, but that part in between is, is time consuming and throws me off a little bit. Chris likes to hunt, big part of his life. Um, went duck hunting this morning. And carried his son, coping with him, and and uh, his first duck hunt. That's some time consuming thing. That's some stuff that takes time. You have to have a place. You have to have some time. To, but notice how it works out. Notice where they are today. Notice where they are now. I just happened to be on Facebook and somebody messaged me, and, and that's a regular thing, but. But then I saw, kind of right next to that, him, him writing this thing about how he carried his son out and they were talking about the Lord. How that that hunt became this conversation about Jesus. How Jesus out at a duck hunt becomes very real. All of a sudden there's an influence being made, an impact being made in his son. And don't think for one second that there wasn't an impact made when he said, okay, we got to leave. So we got to get to church. Why? Because all of a sudden now, the conversation about Jesus takes on reality of a bath and clothes and a trip. You see how it starts to manifest itself in something else? Where Jesus starts, you mean there's Jesus so real that i got to do something about it? And then as Jesus becomes real in, 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 in his little son's life, then it becomes real in relationships. And it becomes real in other conversations. And that's how we become impactful. That's how we become influential in our family. But not just that. What about other ministries? What about in our understanding that we are working witnesses and we are ministry witnesses? How many of you believe that, that reaching teenagers are important? Listen, I was looking just this week uh, at the top ten problems of teenagers and, and, pre and depression and, and sexual activities. 5.3% of all births this year will be teen births. 3.1 million um, adolescents in the U.S. will uh, have at least one major depressive episode this year. Um, in drug abuse, 6% six, 6 of 12th graders use marijuana daily. Alcohol use, self-perception, academic problems, all peer pressure, social media issues, all of these issues in the teenager's life. I mean, of you believe that it's important that the church, that God move in that situation? I mean, we look at teenagers today and say, man, don't you wish God would do something about it? That only happens if people do something about it. So, I'm going to show you how it works. So we have a guy, Justin Hart. Justin, if you come up here. I didn't tell you I was going to do that. Surprise, come here. <laughs> so here's the vocational guy. All the way. <laughs> here's the vocational guy. Who on Monday morning during our prayer meeting, people say, Lord, please, bless Brother Justin, give him the wisdom to do what he needs to do. He gets a couple bucks from New York Baptist Church, but basically, where you work? Center point. Center point energy. Okay? So, blame him if you've got gas issues. <laughs> he's not a medical guy, he's the other kind of guy. <laughs> so, 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 here's the guy, vocational guy, next level guy, vision guy, high vision, high impact guy. But it takes, it takes time, it takes money. 
So they decide they're going to have a, a chili cook-off, cake auction, bake sale kind of thing, right? So he has to get some help, right? <clears throat> so he gets some help. Uh, is Miss Jocelyn in the room? Come here, Miss Jocelyn. Is Carly here? Come here, Carly. I'm on down. So they help get some prizes together for the chili cook-off. Come here, Jonathan. Jonathan, put together the chili cook-off. Just like her mom, I'm trying to preach a message. <laughs> We're almost done. I don't see how it puts together. See, so it gets some people together. Not vocational people necessarily, but the ministry people that are putting ministry into action. And so then Tabby puts together, come on, <laughs> the cake auction. You know they made $1,500 at the cake auction? I've never seen anything like that. I've never been to a cake auction before. That was the funnest, funnest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> or one of the funnest things I've ever seen. They were bidding against each other. That Miss Weir, where's Miss Weir? She was ruthless. <laughs> never seen them. Never seen a $250 cake before. I guess they exist. Right? So you have, and then Brother Scott, where's Brother Scott? Come on. Brother Scott had been practicing his, his auctioneering. He did a great job auctioneering. That was, that was real cool when he was uh, putting it on people, putting pressure on people. And then, so you have these people who invest their time, invest their efforts. Why? Because the teen issues are important. And we want to see God work in this world, right? And so somebody had to make chili. How many of you made chili? Please stand. There we go. How many ate chili? Please stand. How many served chili? Please stand. You served it, helped serve it. The teenagers all served the chili. Um, if you made a cake, please stand. If you were going to make a cake, but they didn't want too many cakes, please stand. Because there were people who offered to make cakes, and we didn't need that many cakes, but they still made the cakes. They had a corn hole tournament. Uh, Travis, where are you? Come here, Travis. Travis put together a corn hole tournament. Tournament. If you played in the cornhole tournament, please stand. If you've won the cornhole tournament, please be quiet. <laughs> right? Now, just kind of look around what's going on. You see, you can all be seated. You see how God works in his world? Everybody's telling me, man, it just seems like there's a dark world. God's not really moving. Uh, he's not moving because we're not moving. And as people who have God in them through Christ Jesus, because of Christ Jesus, then as those people move, guess what? That begins to happen. God begins to move. And they begin to be people of influence, people of impact, people of witness. People of vocation. God has lifted up. We never have a God problem. It's always the people of God being willing to submit to the things of God. Maybe you've never submitted to salvation as the musicians come. Maybe you've never submitted to what God is doing in your life. I'm telling you, God is moving. You just have to get on. It's like a ride of six flags. Brother Tony, what? what if it doesn't work? Brother Tony, I'm scared. It's like a ride of six flags. All you got to do is get on. God's doing the movement. He's providing the power. All you have to do is get on. When the bar drops, you ride. My wife said, I don't want to get in here because I'm scared to fly. So you don't have to fly. You just have to get on. Somebody else, the plane will do the flying. You just sit down. Guys, listen, God is working in your world. Are you submissive to what God is doing as we stand together? Lord God, today we love you. Lord, even as we've gone a little long today, I just pray that, that you help us to see the importance of impact, the importance of you working in our lives, the importance of you, Lord God, and what you're doing in this world, and help us to see the reality of it. How, Lord God, you've given us as common people a very uncommon thing when you've given us salvation, you've given us your presence, and you've given us a purpose in your world. Lord God, don't let us take it for granted. Make your name great in us, through us, 
in your world, in our families, in our lives, especially during this time of the year, we have extra opportunities to point to you. Your precious Son, Jesus Christ's name.